honestly believe through and through, down to your guts, that you can make something important happen in your life, you're the ones most likely to succeed in this room, bar none. I'll bet my money on you. How do I know that? Because history is filled with examples of men and women who believed with all their heart that they can do something, and then they pursued those beliefs, and something amazing came to be. Think about it. Your beliefs lead to your behaviors. Your behaviors lead to your results. You want to have better results? Don't just improve your behaviors. You've got to improve your beliefs. It's all about beliefs. Why is it that immigrants who come to the United States of America are four times as likely to become millionaires than born Americans? Why is that? It's a very simple reason for that. They believe that the streets of America are still paved with gold. I am one of those immigrants. There are others sitting in this room here this afternoon. So it's all about believing. Dr. Ben Carson was the first person who was, who was successful in separating two Siamese twins as little children. I think it was in South Africa back in the late 90s. He became noted the world over because of his ingenious ways of taking these two children who were connected at the back of the head and separating them successfully. And now the whole world knows about Ben Carson and his capacity to do what seemed impossible to so many. He believed he could do it. And if he were here, he would describe to you with great detail how he did it and how many hours it took him to do it. He then went on to head the whole department at Johns Hopkins University today. People are urging him to run as president of the United States, and he just might do that. Uh, ben Carson is one of those uh, members of Horatio Alger Association for Distinguished Americans, of which I'm a member. There are about 300 members in Horatio Alger. Every one of them has done something pretty amazing in their life. I am the least of the crowd by far. But the founder of uh, Starbucks is a member. Um, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas is a member. Oprah Winfrey is a member. Henry Kissinger is a member. There isn't a person in that membership who has done something incredible, extraordinary, amazing in their life. Many, many billionaires that you see on the Forbes 400 are members. And yet every one of them came from humble beginnings. Every one of them overcame tremendous adversity. Every one of them believed in his or her heart that they could build something remarkable in their life separating fact from fiction. There's no mystery to it. It's just an ability of understanding the system and following the system accurately and thoroughly in a remarkable way. Dr. Ben Carson says that if you were to learn a fact or a piece of knowledge every three seconds of your life, what is three seconds? Here are three seconds. 3,000, 2,000, 1,000. That was three seconds. If every three seconds you were to learn one new fact in your life, it would take you three million years to fill the capacity in your mind. Do not underestimate you. Do not underestimate your capacity to do amazing things in your life. Do not let anyone ever tell you that you can't climb the highest mountain. You can build the greatest company. You can have the highest level of profit. You can enjoy success and significance in the best of ways. Capacity for us to learn and to grow is incredible. It's almost infinite. Three million years it would take. I can't even thoroughly mathematically understand that. And so... What are the obstacles that are keeping you from growing your business? It isn't just about transactional things. It isn't just about learning how to do this or how to add that or who to hire. Really, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Life is like a jigsaw puzzle. Building a successful business is like a jigsaw puzzle. All the pieces must A, be there, and B, must be placed on that puzzle in such a way that every piece builds on the piece prior to it so you can have a complete puzzle. It's like the alphabet. You can know all the letters of the alphabet, but if you don't know how to put the letters of the alphabet in order, then what good is it to know the letters of the alphabet? You would have no usefulness. That's the problem with a lot of people, is that they have so much information, but they have not learned to put their information in such order that they can complete the jigsaw puzzle and therefore enjoy the best that life has to offer. What are the obstacles in your life? 
What's keeping you this very moment on this afternoon in Orlando, Florida from achieving your deepest goals? Honestly now, think about it. What is the fear, the worry? What is it that's holding you back from achieving whatever it is you want to achieve? In business, in life, in your family, in your community, wherever it might be. What is that obstacle? When I became president of High Point University on my very first day, I looked outside my office towards the library and I couldn't see the library. There were two trees, you see, between me and the library. And I called Jerry. Jerry was the head of our maintenance and, and uh, landscaping and so on. I said, Jerry, I'm trying to look at the library. I can't see the library, man. What good is it to have a university if you can't see the library? And Jerry said, you know, we planted these two trees some years ago. These trees have grown up so much now, and those trees are blocking your view of the library. I said, well, Jerry, as much as I love trees, you must chop these trees down. We've got to see the library. He said, are you serious? I said, I'm dead serious. Take down those two trees. Now I said, Jerry, wait till after dark. I don't want the tree huggers letting the air out of my tires. But after dark, you let them come down. And he did. And the next morning, people came to campus, and you could see they're confused. They looked around like something is missing, something is wrong, but nobody could figure out what it is. And finally, somebody said, look, there's a library over there. And that was the English teacher. We said, yeah, there's a library over there. And then I gathered all the team together, and I said, isn't it amazing? That here's the place that encompasses all the learning of all ages. And we couldn't see it. And visitors to our campus couldn't even know it. And what did we do? We removed the two trees and now everybody could see the library. What are the obstacles that are keeping you from seeing your library? And how much courage and faith does it take for you to chop those obstacles down? Maybe you failed once in your life and you're afraid now to do it all over again. Maybe you had a partnership that didn't work out and somehow, some way, you say, I'll never do that again. These are all obstacles. Our mind, capable of carrying all this information, as Dr. Ben Carson said, our mind doesn't just allow information to come in and out. It actually stores it and recalls it when needed. What are you recalling? That's what I mean about beliefs. Your beliefs will pretty much dictate how well you do in growing your business. Let me show you something. You see this check? Do you notice that this check is for $3 million? Do you also notice that at the very bottom of the check, it says right here, it says pledge, third installment. This actually completed a $10 million gift. Do you also notice that this check is scribbled out by the person who gave it to me? Like it's just $3 million. It's not worthy of running it through a computer. This is probably written in a check that this guy kept in his glove compartment in the car and just wrote it out. But it's $3 million. How many $3 million checks have you gotten lately? This is a gift, $3 million from this guy. He gave me $10 million. It's pretty cool. Notice, please, that it's dated July 9, 2013. This is check is only about two, three months old. How about this check? When was the last time you saw a $10 million check? That's yours. This gentleman wrote me a $10 million check. It's only ironic that this check also is written on July 9, 2013. So on July 9, 2013, I collected $13 million for High Point University as a gift from two people. I show you these checks because these two people came from nothing, absolutely nothing. And I'll tell you their stories in just a moment. But they believed, man. They believed that if they could learn a system, they could apply it in their life, they could build a business, they could make something amazing come to be. Today, these two individuals are billionaires. They have a lot of money. And they're capable of writing checks for $10 million one time 
as a gift to a university. And I'm the luckiest guy in the world because I know so many of these people. It's amazing. They're just like you and me. There's no difference. There's absolutely no difference. They take a shower like you and I do. They use the bathroom like you and I do. They need food every day like you and I do. And yet they've been capable to build amazing organizations. Wouldn't it be great to just dig into their brain, find out how they think, what did they do, how did they get there, what were some of the obstacles, when did they chop them down, what gave them the motivation to chop these obstacles down. On that note that you have in front of you where you're taking notes, would you write down this word, please? Write down in all caps the word AMERICAN. I know some of you are not from the United States of America, and you're certainly welcome one and all, but just write down the word American for this exercise. Please note that the last four letters of that word are the letters I can. Would you look to the person to your right or to the person to your left and tell them, I can. Go ahead. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, yes, I can. What do you mean I can't? Yes, I can. If I put my mind to it, I can. That's what this guy did. This guy grew up in the state of Wisconsin. This guy did not even have indoor plumbing, for crying out loud. This guy never went to college. This guy built one of the biggest conglomerates in America, and I'll tell you about it momentarily. It's incredible. He's a buddy of mine. I spoke to his company the other day. You'd love this man. You'd love this guy. Because, man, this guy made it the real way. Just came up from nothing and built it one bit at a time. And if you pick up Forbes magazine, top 400, he's listed right there. In the top 200, the richest people in the world. He lives in a little town in Wisconsin. And has a home, he is in Florida. He doesn't have one airplane, he has three airplanes. And all three airplanes are challengers, man. That's where you can just sleep and you can do your thing. I had a guy in my office on Thursday afternoon who flew in to see me on a G5. You know who flies on G5? Kings and queens fly on G5s. Uh, he happens to be the chairman CEO of the, one of the largest financial institutions in the country with assets of $850 billion dollars. That guy, too, came from nothing. So I'm telling you, beliefs. What is it that you're believing here today? And what is it you're willing to do with these beliefs? And so, um, you know, there are four kinds of capital, and then there's a fifth. To succeed, to build your business, you have to have financial capital. Of course, you have to have money. You can't start a business without money. And you have to have relational capital. The greatest asset I have in my life are the people I know. I know tons and tons of people. Somebody said, you know, how do you define the word power? Power equals access. I will know how powerful you are by who you know and who you can access. Why is it that people who work in the White House, as an example, and then leave the White House and start these consulting companies and make tens and tens of millions of dollars, because they have access, because they can introduce governments and companies and others to people of influence with whom they can do business. And people are willing to pay big money to make that access possible. And so you're as good as the relationships that you have. In all your comings and all your goings, be sure you're picking up along the way people you know and people who know you who are, who are influential and who are important. And be good to them and be nice to them and be respectful to them so that they can keep you as their friend for a long time. It isn't just about taking a picture with somebody. It's about building relationships with people. And then, of course, reputation. Nothing is ever more important than your reputation. Maybe your character is more important than your reputation. I like to say reputation is what people think you are. Character is what God knows you are. But your reputational capital is as important as your financial capital. Because if you have a really good reputation, somebody will lend you the money. Somebody will invest money with you. Somebody will let, will let you, uh, you know, participate in their activity. And then, of course, you have educational capital. That's why you're here. I admire you. That you've taken your Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday to be here because you want to learn. I admire you deeply for that. You sit here and you take notes. There isn't a person in this room who's not bright, intelligent, experienced, 
Every one of you is, and yet you're here sitting in a classroom to learn. I have great admiration for people who try to build their educational capital. I wake up every morning at the latest by 4 o'clock. I study from 4 till 6 every morning. Every morning I study from 4 to 6. I'm an informed person. I can speak for a long time. I can come up with new ideas because I've got all kinds of stuff I'm putting in my brain every day. So these are four kinds of capital, but none of them will be worth anything if you are sick, disabled, don't feel good. So physical capital, of course, is the most important of all. So, you know, when you're looking at these beliefs, I like to see what people believe about wealth. Now, look, folks, I was a poor guy once upon a time, and thank God I'm not there anymore. And I sort of made up my way along the pathways. I failed a few times. I succeeded many more times than I failed. I was able to make right decisions. So I have studied people who are wealthy in life. I know that most millionaires are not workaholics. They're not. There are people like me who go to the beach and be a beach bum for a long time. I do that a lot. You don't know me until you see Nido in his Speedo, let me tell you. That's a sight to behold. I have a friend of mine, by the way, talking about beliefs. I have a friend of mine who went to see his doctor the other day. This guy's like 90-some years old. He went to see his doctor, and the doctor said, Oh my gosh, you look fabulous. What did you do? He said, Well, doc, I followed your advice. The doctor said, I've forgotten what I told you. What, what was my advice? And this 90-some-year-old man said, Doctor, you told me to... Find myself a hot mama and be cheerful. The doctor said, no, I told you you have a heart murmur. Be careful. <laughs> it's the same guy, you know, this guy I know, he just celebrated his 40th wedding anniversary. 40th wedding anniversary. He said, on my 40th wedding anniversary, I'm taking my wife to Italy. Then he said, on my 50th wedding anniversary, I'm going to go back there to pick her up. <laughs> She'll probably find some hot young Italian and wouldn't come back after all of that. Most millionaires are not workaholics. They have a ball. They amaze you. They do all kinds of fun things in their life. So um, these are important wealth facts. Most, are, most rate luck at the very bottom of their wealth factors. Most most wealthy people may tell you, oh, you know, I was lucky. That's their humble way of saying to you, you know, it just kind of happened. But when you really ask them, they'll tell you it wasn't luck. It was hard work. Most of them are not geniuses. Most of them are not geniuses. And uh, most of them say the seed of their wealth is their vocation, it's their job, it's their work. That's where they got their money from. Most see an economic opportunity others ignore. Hello. That's what they do. The richest people among us are the ones who see an opportunity that other people, you know, just simply don't see at all. So, you know, it's like this one. You may have seen this one before. Somebody offered you $100,000 or one penny that doubles every day for a month. Which would you take? The truth is, most people, be assured, most people would take $100,000. Most people would accept the $100,000. If we stacked the $100,000 on this table like this, or we showed them the penny, most people would take the $100,000. You know how diamonds were discovered in South Africa years and years ago? There were children playing in the street, marbles. And a visitor came by and saw these kids playing with marbles and noticed that one of those marbles was kind of shiny and he took it and chipped away at it. It was a diamond. And that's how diamonds were discovered way back when. That's how De Beers came to be. So $100,000 or one penny, most people we know for sure will take the $100,000 when they see it. They wouldn't bet on the penny doubling every day. The reality of it is, if a penny were to double every day, this is what it would look like. On the second day, not much happens. It becomes two pennies and then four and then eight and so on. And by the tenth day, it'll only be five bucks. The second ten days is a little different. The penny doubling every day. By, tenth, by the twentieth day, it becomes $5,000. Most people at that point would still take the $100,000 and give you the penny back because two-thirds of a month has passed and nothing happened. The power of compounding interest is right here in front of us. Look what happens on the 25th day. The 25th day, the penny doubling every day becomes greater 
than the $100,000. Let me ask you, ladies and gentlemen, how many people do you know who would stick with anything five-sixths of the time? If you went on a diet for six months, how many people would stick to that diet five months out of six? If you went on a plan to start your business and, and make money work, and maybe you've had some obstacles and some failures along the way, how many people will stick to it? How many people will give up? We know, studies show us repeatedly that less than 1% of the people really stick to it through and through and through. Most people just give up at some point. But if you're stuck with it 25 days, five-sixths of the month, you would have gotten more than $100,000. And of course, the rest of the story speaks for itself. If you're stuck to it for the month, you will have about $11 million to your name. It's pretty darn remarkable, but most of us will not do that. Now, of course, there is no such penny. But there is something called Google, and there's something called Facebook, and there's something called Old Dominion Freight Line. The chairman and CEO of Old Dominion is a buddy of mine. We walk every morning at 6 o'clock. This is a $3 billion business, very successful business. Started from nothing, almost went under in 1990. Today, it's just going through the roof. It's unbelievable. There are indeed pennies that double over and over and over again, if only we're looking for those opportunities. So really, the test at the end of the day is this question right here. I hope you'll forgive me when I say this, but at the end of the day, someone who's arguing with you about economic issues and building business and doing this and this is the way it works, you want to bring a discussion to an end really quickly, just kindly, lovingly say, what is your net worth? Because if you're so smart about doing all these things, let's discuss something quantitative. What is your net worth? I'm not suggesting that we should measure people based on their net worth. Far from it. I personally do not believe that money is what makes life so amazing. I don't. I believe relationships make life so amazing. Money just helps. Money helps you to do the things that you'd like to do, including stewardship and philanthropy. It's hard to help other people if you don't have the means with which to do it. To that extent, money is a good thing. So, um, what is your net worth? You know, what are all the assets that you have now? What do you have now? What is it that you owe? What is your net worth? Let me give you just a bit of, of advice. Your net worth ought to grow by a minimum of 10% every year. This is the road to true success, economic success. Your net worth should grow by 10% as a minimum every single year. That's the test. Now, I know people who don't even do this test. They don't even know what their net worth is. You know, I've taught my children every single month, at the end of each month, you pull out your net worth statement, and you look at it, and you update it. And you're reminded, and you do a graph, you're reminded every single month, did I go forward, did I go backward, did I stay flat? Why, and why, and what can I learn from it, and how can I improve it, realign it, and move in a different direction to get better results? You want to grow your business? Yes, it gets down to some mechanics, but I'm not discussing mechanics of a balance sheet and so on. I'm, becoming, I'm, I'm discussing mechanics of mindset and beliefs, that we have to believe that we can make it happen, and then we have to use those, those equations that get us there. So that was number one, beliefs. You want to grow your business? You got to have the right beliefs. If you don't have the right beliefs, everything I'm about to say is useless, meaningless, has no basis. I know lots and lots of people who have knowledge but don't believe the right thing, and just at the right moment, they screw it all up, and they mess it all up. So your beliefs are everything. And I know what your beliefs are in about a three-minute discussion. Three-minute discussion with you in the hallway can pretty much tell me what it is you believe in. I ask you the right question, I'll know just like that, whether you believe the right things or you don't. How can I make such a statement? I've talked to literally thousands of people. I personally know maybe at least a thousand people who are at least multimillionaires. And I've watched to see how they got there. What are, it doesn't take a genius to figure it out. It's simply research. I figured out the commonalities, the similarities that they all have. What is it? What is it that makes certain people start a business and turn it into a $100 million business? And that's not even that much anymore into a half a billion or a billion dollar business. What is that? How do these people get into these means and then the world pays attention to them and welcomes them into their midst? 
The second major area for growing your business is knowledge. Just believing and not knowing is insufficient. It's an incomplete formula. So clearly, we have to have knowledge. You can't just believe that you can grow the biggest business and not know how to do it. That would be silly at best. That would be a waste of resources, both human resources and financial resources, the same. So what is that knowledge that we want? I'll, I'll give it to you right here. Number one, you've got to understand people, baby, let me tell you. You've got to understand people. I have never personally seen anybody succeed over a prolonged period of time over a sustainable life journey who didn't know how to build bridges with other human beings. I've never known such a person. Oh, I've known lots of people who succeed for a little while and then they crash. They make one big mistake and take them down in the dumpity dump. I've never known anybody who succeeded over 10, 20, 30 years, their whole life looked that way, who didn't understand people, respect people, get along with people, help people, and try to elevate people. The more you help other people get what they want out of life, the more somehow life will give you on a silver tray what you want out of life. So for me, kindness is a prerequisite. Integrity and kindness and human dignity are cornerstones to life and living. Absent that, it doesn't matter what else you have in the bank. You're missing the very ingredient that gives you the kind of security and safety necessary. So if you're working in a business, you've got to get the best people. You've got to get the best people. If they're your employees, you better get the best people at your employees. If they're your partners, you better get the best people at your partners. Now, I'm saying the best people. Don't just jump on the first person who dangles a few dollars in front of you. You've got to get the best people. What does best people mean? It means they have knowledge and skill and experience and all the other characteristics and tenets that you believe are significant to build a relationship with you. Think about the koi fish. You put a koi fish in a fish bowl, it never grows to more than about two inches in size. You put it in a, in a lake somewhere, it grows to about a foot in size. The koi fish grows proportionately to the environment in which it resides. So do you. You may not realize it, but consciously and unconsciously, you grow equal to the environment in which you reside. If you hang around really smart people, you grow as a smart person. If you hang around a bunch of dinglings, it's a matter of time before you become a dingling. Right? So who we spend time with is very, very important. What we choose is, is very, very important. I want to hang around people who are making something happen in life. I think if you followed me for a week, you'll see I don't waste time. I enjoy my time. I'm speaking here this afternoon. I was supposed to go on about 3.15. I think I went on about 3.20 or so. But I literally didn't leave till 2 o'clock. So I have things to do. I did lots of things today. Right? So I value time. I watch time very, very carefully. And um, I hang around people who can feed my soul, who can nourish my brain, who can nurture my heart. Those are the people who are so valuable to have in our life. And I like vertical thinkers. I'm bored by horizontal thinkers. You know, horizontal thinkers are the people at a cocktail party to talk about nothing of significance. After a while, they're boring. You've heard it all. I want somebody who will sort of stimulate me in some meaningful way. Let me ask you a question. If it takes five machines five minutes to make five widgets, if it takes five machines, five minutes to make five widgets, just keep the answer in your head, please. How long will it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? Keep it inside your head. How long will it take a hundred machines to make a hundred widgets? The right answer is five minutes. If you said anything other than five minutes and 95% of you came up with an answer other than five minutes, that was horizontal thinking. You assume because it's five minutes, five machines, five minutes, five widgets, therefore 100 machines will need 100 minutes to make 100 widgets. And that fails the test. That's the exact illustration of what I mean about a vertical thinker or a horizontal thinker. A horizontal thinker thinks like this all the time, just at the surface of everything. A vertical thinker is thinking the second and third layers. A diagonal thinker connects the two. 
connects all the dots. These are the people who rise to the top. These are the people who grow their businesses in amazing ways. How does one become a vertical thinker? Rule number one, you hang around other vertical thinkers. Now you say to me, well, I don't have access to these people. You have access to their books, to their CDs. You can go on YouTube and watch 30, 40 of my videos as a simple example. It costs you zero. You go to my website and see a million things. It costs you zero. This is no excuse to say I have no access to this person or that person. That's purely an excuse. The reality of it is today with social media and technology, we can access everything there is. The body of knowledge is almost all available to us at a whim. And so are you a vertical thinker? And if not, I'm telling you, that's a cornerstone to having the kind of real knowledge to grow a business. Now, I'm not interested in giving somebody a formula where they can grow their business the next six months, but then fail two years from now. I'm interested in ideas that are so foundational that cumulatively you can build your business and succeed forever. Not occasionally. How many people do you know who have succeeded and failed, who have bet their life and then just found themselves down in the gutter? Now, you know, every one of those you hear has done that and then just climbed up again. I'll show you a thousand who didn't. I thought I'd show you a thousand who had, to, who had to claim bankruptcy and who have difficulty today to do certain things and life has become more problematic and so on. So hang around the right people. Be in the midst of the right people. I believe today you're with the right people because this is a zone of people who have one thing in common. Every one of us in this room wants to do something significant in life. That's why you're here. As I said, I admire you. I like people who are trying to do something important in life. Not just success, measured by money, but true significance. You know what true significance is? You know how you know how rich you are with true significance? One English word, impact. What have you done to impact the world in which you live? The people in your immediate circle, the people in your larger circle. You are as rich as your impact. And when you die and when I die, they're going to write on our epitaph a few words. What will, you, what will your, through, your few words be? I hope mine will be, he really worked hard at impacting the lives of others. Or some such words. Because it's all about impact. I'm a university president because I have access to 5,000 students whose lives I can enrich every day. If you were with me last night at a ball game, University of North Carolina in Greensboro, where High Point played and regretfully lost by six points, and when I walked into that into Coliseum, 800 or 900 of our students who came to the game start screaming, "Nido, Nido, Nido!" The chancellor of the other school said to me, "What is this? What do you feed these kids? What do you pay these kids?" I said, "Nothing. I've invested in building relationships with them. We're friends. We love each other." That same principle applies to life entirely and completely. So knowledge, number one, knowledge of people. How many books have you read about how to get along with people? How many books have you read about how to communicate with people or how to connect with people? Now, we've read books on selling and marketing, but all of that is connecting with people first. We've read books about how to find a partner and you know, go into real estate and become a multimillionaire, but that involves people. How much do we know about this most important of elements called people? Second is the process. The process of running a business. You know, productivity is probably the most important way to grow your business. It's called efficiency. It's called output over input. So you input money in a business and you want to output profit out of the business. You input time in your business and you must output results out of that business. You input energy in your business, and you must output success out of your business. So output over input equals productivity. The higher the output, the better the result. It's that simple. If you invest three hours in something, uh, I'll give you, let me give you a better example than that. Uh, the guy who wrote um, Good to Great is a wonderful author. He does not speak to an audience unless it has about four or 500 CEOs of significant companies. I tried to get him at the university. I couldn't. I'd pay him any amount of money to come. 
He wants to speak to audiences that are filled with CEOs of significant companies. Why? He figured out his productivity, input of time and energy, output. Give him 400 CEOs, there are going to be five of them are going to sign with him multi-million dollar contracts. Very intelligent. McKinsey and company would not accept an assignment from you or from me for anything under a million dollars. Why? They've inputted the notion, if we're going to input this thing and run it through our system, we can make enough profit unless it's a million dollars or more. So they set the standard. Now the Boston Group, Boston Consulting Group does the same thing. Others, Bain and Company does the same thing. It become a multi-billion dollar company. That's what I mean about productivity. That every day in every way, everything called time, is not time, it's energy. Time, energy, life management is dependent on productivity. It's part of the process is marketing. You want to grow your business and make money? You have to market. Marketing is very important. You've got to ask the most three important questions. Why should someone do business with me? Why should someone do business with you? Very important question. If you can't answer that question in 12 words or less, you don't have a clear vision about your business. Why should someone do business with you? How easily can somebody, how easily can somebody else um, um, imitate what you do? The easier it is for somebody else to imitate what you do, the less valuable by definition you have now just become. And if I were in the marketplace to buy what you have to offer, would I think of you first? Would I think of you second? Would I think of you at all? If I don't think of you at all, there's no chance we're going to do business together. If I think of you second, you better find out who I think of first. And what are they doing better than what you're doing so that next time you can get the deal instead of them getting the deal. You can apply that to your own life, to your own business, to your own application. But the principle is the same. It's the principle of marketing. It's all about geographic, ge geometric progression. It's all really about sort of a word of mouth. You know, you influence two people, and through them you meet four people, and through them you meet eight people, and then you meet 16, and so on. It's the power of network marketing. I like network marketing because the power of it appeals to me, geometric progression. It just grows. Your impact grows. The power grows. No person can be an island. We need other people to build an organization. And so marketing means, in part, establishing geometric progression. It also means positioning. How are you positioned in the marketplace? You know, I always say, when you go see somebody, never leave their office without leaving something behind. That's called trail of tangibles. Never, ever. That should be a rule that you never violate. And if it's a business card, it better be a memorable business card or they're going to throw it away. Maybe it's a book you've written. Maybe it's a gift they'll place on their desk. People give me gifts all the time. I get, I get gifts almost every day. I'm very grateful for them, but I can't keep them all. So I keep the most beautiful ones. If you came to my office, I have a gift somebody gave me when I was 40 years old. My mother used to say, if you want to be a great needle, you must first walk hand in hand and side by side with great people. So this person uh, got a sculpture to sculpt for me with, with glass, uh, me in the middle, Abraham Lincoln over here, and Albert Einstein over here all holding hands. It's an incredible piece. It's about this big. I'm not sure I thoroughly appreciated the gift when I got it. But today, more than two decades later, I still have the gift in a very respectable place in my office. I look at it every day. That's a trail of tangibles. That person, I have not forgotten. That person has gotten a lot of business from me by sheer fact that I would remember them by seeing it there. When somebody gives me chocolate, we eat the chocolate and it's forgotten. That's not a trail of tangibles. When you send someone a box of peanuts, that's nice, but that's not a trail of tangibles. We eat it and it's gone. Always make sure you leave a trail of tangibles. Always make sure that people remember you long after they've seen you. The second one I do every day is wrap around. Everything must have wrap around. If you have an event, if you have a promotion, if you have a mailing, if you're giving a speech somewhere, never look at anything as a singular event. Always see it as an ongoing process. So if I get a speaker at High Point University, we announce that the news releases before. Uh, we, we then get the speaker, and we have a cocktail party before the speaker for, for our big donors. Then the speaker speaks, then we have a Q&A, then we put a DVD, then we put it on public television, then we make the DVD to everybody in our, on our list, then we put them in, on our campus. With 30, 40 ways we wrap around that single event. Can you see how when you, when you allocate costs that way, then the cost of an event becomes minimal? Now, I don't mean just an event. I'm talking about anything. 
Anything that you do should always have a wraparound effect to it. And of course, every day, I write four notes to people. That's something I've done for 30 years. That's a simple way to position yourself. Uh, this morning, I sent four notes. One of them was to a lady who has become the worldwide uh, vice president of HR for a major company called Culp Incorporated. And I cut this nice profile of her in the paper, and I wrote her a nice handwritten note, and I gave it to my assistant. I said, mail this to her. And I do this every single day. If I read a book that I like, I send it to people. I have a list of 100, my 100 most important clients. And my 100 most important clients hear from me regularly. Almost once a month, they're going to get something from me. Get in the habit of writing a note. It could be an email even. It could be a phone call even. But how do you keep your name, your business, your company, your product, your service in front of other people if you don't do that? This is the principle with which I live my life. Be selectively extravagant and prudently frugal. Yes, in life you have to be frugal if you're going to build wealth. But there are times you better be selectively extravagant. If you're inviting somebody important to your home, that's the time to put out the best dinner you'd imagine. That's the time you put out your finest china. That's the time you buy flowers from outside to make your home look great. Selectively extravagant. Sometimes, for some of you in this room, it may have been a stretch to fly here from around the world, to pay the fee to be here, to pay for the hotel. You are at this moment being selectively extravagant to invest in your future, in your learning, in your business. You're being selectively extravagant. That's okay. You can't do that every day. You have to be prudently frugal and selectively extravagant. And you'll see that you're positioning yourself in ways that are significant and important. And the third P about knowledge is called the product. Obviously, we all sell a product or sell a service. So I call it the product, the three P's of knowledge. People, process, and product. Knowledge about business, that is. The three P's of any business. The people, process, and product. And so when we talk about product, the most important thing we have to ask is value. What is the value of your product? And just remember that value without interpretation of value is worthless. You have to interpret the value of your product if you want people to really buy it. Who determines value? The seller may determine the price. The buyer always determines the value. There is no exception to this rule. The seller may set the price. The buyer will always determine the value. And so before you set any price, you be sure that you know how other people view what you do and what the value of what you do. I have to tell you, and I, I ask God every day for forgiveness and for balance in my life, because in the last five days, I turned down about half a million dollars worth of speaking engagements. Now, I can remember when I would have accepted a 200 speaking engagement in an instant without even thinking twice about it. I would have gone all the way to Spokane, Washington from North Carolina to do such a speech. And yet this week I turned down a speech in Kuwait, I turned down a speech in Istanbul, I turned down a speech in San Diego, and I'm looking at it and I'm saying, how do I say no to a $100,000 speech? But I did, because I placed balance above money. There are times in life that certain resources are more important than others. For me today, you know, with all due respect, I don't want to spend a night here, and this is a very, very lovely hotel. But I want to go home and sleep in my bed tonight. So I value that remarkably. So I'm willing to take the expense of having a private plane, of flying down here, having two pilots, having a driver, to be here with you, because I value that. That's an important thing for me. Interpretation is always in the eye, the beholder is not in your eyes. So this guy in, in, in Kuwait thought if he could just keep adding money to it, it would interest me. It didn't because I know where Kuwait is. And I know it's going to take me two, three days. And I know the time zone. And I know all the difficulty. And yet I'd like to go there. I've never been there. Just timing didn't, didn't make it. JT's been trying to get me to South Africa with him uh, for several times. You know, so far, 
I don't know, you know, but I'd like to. I've never been to South Africa. If we have some from South Africa here, I've never, I've never been there. I'd like, I'd like to go there. I would like to go. I would like to go there, especially if you give me a little bag filled with these little marbles I was talking about. Um, <laughs> that just might be an interesting thing. So value and interpretation. And then about product. Here's something you may have never thought about. I'm going to give you 10 seconds and I'm going to be quiet. And I want you to write down the piece of paper in front of you three things that you believe may irritate your customer about your product or service. Those people who do business with you, who use what you sell or who might participate in what you sell, what are three things that might irritate them about doing business with you? Can you write them down in less than 10 seconds? If you're having a hard time writing him down, it only suggests one thing. You haven't thought about it. You haven't thought about it. It would be like me saying to you, can you write down three things that other people perceive to be weaknesses about you? If you can't write that down in under three or four or five seconds, you just haven't been thinking about it. Admit it. You just don't know the answer. Assignment. We ought to know before somebody else knows. We ought to know exactly what irritates our customers or even our internal customers like our employees and correct it as soon as we possibly can. And then last, think about three things that other people see as wow. If I did business with you, what would cause me to say wow about doing business with you? Can you name me three things that I would say wow? Buying your product, buying your service, doing business with you is unbelievable, is extraordinary. What would those things be? Okay? So, knowledge means the three P's. People, process, product. And wow simply means, wow simply means that I got to know what's really cool about doing business with you. Because if you don't know what's really cool about doing business with you, guess what? It's not showing up in your promotion. It's not showing up in your dialogue. It's not showing up in your publicity. And other people are not feeling it. It's only what you feel that you can promote and promote with a sense of conviction. So let me show you some stuff. Here is, here's how seven companies did it. Let's talk about Wendy's. Wendy's hamburgers. I asked Dave Thomas, the founder of Wendy's. This is, he's been dead now for a few years. This is some years ago. I said, Mr. Thomas, tell me something, please. When I go to McDonald's, I get a round hamburger in a round bun. When I go to Wendy's, I get a round bun, but a square hamburger. Obviously, your engineering department didn't know how to make a round hamburger. Why is that? And he said, oh, I'll tell you the answer to it. He said, when I started Wendy's, I could not sell my hamburgers for 39 cents like McDonald's did. McDonald's had a critical mass. McDonald's had millions of customers, and they could make their prices down. I couldn't do that. And so I had to sell my hamburgers for 59 cents. And the only way you can sell your hamburgers for 59 cents is to make sure that there is differentiation in your product. So he said, we on purpose came out with thicker patties that hung outside of the bread so you can see that our product is bigger and better and therefore you pay 59 cents and I just told you the secret and there it is. They differentiated, that's how they grew their business. How are you differentiating yourself? If I met you today and I met 10 other people in the hallway, how do you stand out? What is it about you that's unique? How would someone say you are differentiated? Ashley Furniture. How many of you know the name Ashley Furniture? 
every name certainly here should know, everyone should know. Ashley Furniture is a $4.5 billion furniture company uh, all over the world. It is owned by a man and his son. His name is Ron Wanick. His son is Todd Wanick. The, 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 the friends of mine, and he is the one who wrote me the $10 million check. Uh, he is a multi-billionaire. His son is a multi-billionaire. He grew up, as I told you, with no indoor plumbing in a little town called Arcadia, Wisconsin. And today he single-handedly and his son own this entire business. And if someone were to buy that business, heaven knows what they'd pay for it. It'll be in the billions and billions of dollars. I said, Ron, how in the world did you do what you did? He said, I had to dominate the market. I had to go in a city and buy some of these stores or get them to associate with me these furniture stores so I could supply them the furniture, they would sell it, and dominate means we had to be big. How do you dominate your niche of the market? How do you dominate your town, your city, your area, whatever you consider to be the place that you want, online, social media, how do you do that? So one differentiates, one dominates. I'm on the board of Lazy Boy Corporation. It's about a $1.3, $1.4 billion uh, furniture company. Uh, Lazy Boy almost went under uh, three, four years ago because when the furniture all almost went to China and we were a manufacturing company and so we got in trouble, uh, the stock went down from $27 a share to $0.60 cents a share. So how did Lazy Boy do it? Management of Lazy Boy and the directors of Lazy Boy decided to reinvent themselves. We went from being a manufacturing company to being a retail company. Instead of just knowing how to make furniture, how to sell furniture in retail stores. Today the stock is back to $23.5. Lazy Boy is doing exceptionally well, paid back all of his debts, sitting on excellent resources. Life is good. How are you reinventing yourself? Maybe you failed in the last deal. Maybe you lost a job and you started to start a business. How are you reinventing yourself? In a world that's changing, how are you growing your business by reinventing yourself? I am on the board of BB&T Corporation. It's the ninth largest financial institution in America. It has assets of $185 billion. How did BB&T get there? They acquired their way through growth. It's called M&A, Mergers and Acquisitions. A few guys and I started a bank in 1985, and we sold it to BB&T. We made a lot of money selling it. And I went on their board, and I've been on that board for well over two decades now. BB&T bought literally hundreds of companies, smaller banks, insurance companies, and so on, to build this enormous company that it is today from Florida all the way up to Maryland and beyond, and offices across America, 35,000 employees. It acquired its way. Maybe you can grow your business by acquiring somebody else who is smaller than you are, who maybe needs your resources. I got into half a dozen businesses exactly that way. I didn't even have to put money in it. I brought my knowledge and skill and experience and contacts. And they said, we will give you a third of this business, or we'll give you half of this business. And over the years, I helped them build the business. And in the end, they did well. I did well. Everybody did just fine. It's a great way to grow your business. Let's look at Great Harvest. That's my company. I own Great Harvest Bread Company. It's um, how did we grow Great Harvest? Simply by branding. We don't advertise a Great Harvest. We just make fresh bread every day. And females who are our customers love it so much they're willing to drive out of their way 20, 30 minutes to buy this bread for the family they like. And in 2000, when we bought the company, and Dr. Atkins told everybody not to eat bread, and I thought I'm going to lose my entire investment in this company, right? And where is Atkins today? He's dead. Why? He didn't eat any carbs. He died. You know, that's what happened. So, um, so where are we today? We're thriving. We're thriving. It's not a huge company. It does $120 million a year. It's a very successful company. You don't advertise. There's no cost of real doing business in terms of promoting it because advocacy promotes it. Because our female customer, she tells other people about us. And she stays with us. Brand insistence and brand advocacy. It's a magnificent way to build a business. 
Another one is Dots. It's another company on whose board I serve. It's 500 stores selling women's clothing. Our customer is a lady between the age of 25 and 35 principally who is looking for a lower price, high value, lower price. She works. She wants to have her entire outfit for under $30 or $40. And so she goes to Dots. So Dots chose to take the avenue of price. I just gave you six there. Differentiate yourself. Dominate the market. Reinvent yourself. Acquire other groups. Brand yourself. Price yourself in a way that people will do business with you. And then look at High Point University. High Point University, when I got there, was a small organization. Let me show you. We niched ourselves, and I'll explain how. Let me show you what we did at High Point University. Take a look. You don't have to look at all the numbers, small numbers. You can just look on the right-hand side column, all the way to the farthest right-hand side column. It tells the story. Every number is three digits or higher in growth. Do we know how to grow this organization? I don't think there's a cynic in the world who would argue the point. We didn't grow this organization. Oh, and by the way, forgive me, please, from, from the year... Oops, sometimes I'm not as used to this... Uh, let me see if I bring it back. I'm not as used to this clicker. Uh, forgive me, please, but from 08 till now, we're still in recessionary times. People are still bemoaning the most disrupted economic times in the last 65 years in America. And we're growing three digits. I mean, we're growing in triple digits. Come on. It's about beliefs. It's about knowledge. It's not about that stuff. Look at these numbers. It's unbelievable, these numbers. Just look at them in graph form. They're incredible. Almost anything you look at, growth of enrollment, growth in residential students living on campus, growth in total revenues, Growth in faculty count. It doesn't matter what you look at. The graph is going up, 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 up. Look at this. How would you like in the midst of a recession to take a net worth of an organization from $70 million to today about really $520 million in net, in net worth? It's pretty remarkable. The size of campus. Some of you have been to High Point. You know that we were landlocked 92 acres. Today we have almost 365 acres. We bought 750 houses, demolished them to get land. Even our giving, even our giving to, to charitable causes uh, uh, grew in magical ways. So what is it all about, ladies and gentlemen? It's about beliefs. It's about knowledge. And it's about tenacity. Oh my goodness, if you want to talk about growing your business, you got to show me some tenacity. When I began my business, I had no money, 500 bucks straight out of graduate school. I worked day and night to make it happen, and I was selling leadership materials through direct mail. Now I was like 23 years old, 24 years old. And uh, somebody let me sort of get a little office free for about six months with a desk in it. And that's how I began my business. There were no internet in those years. There was no Facebook and texting and emailing. You know, we did it the old-fashioned way. And I didn't have money to go rent mailing lists to mail catalogs so people can buy my goods. So what did I do? I'll tell you what I did. I went to a local telephone company. And I met with the boss of the company. And I told him I'm a young man who came to America with nothing. And I'd like to make something of my life. And I'm willing to work hard. And all I'm looking for is some people to help me along the way. Not with money. Just open up a few doors of opportunity for me. And he said, well, young man, how can I be of help to you? And I said, I'll tell you. Would you be willing to let me come here at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? Go into your library and borrow one of your yellow page books for a certain city. We'll say Cincinnati, Los Angeles, Orlando. I would take that book, I'd go back to my office, and with two fingers I would type the names of the customers from the book on little labels. And at 8 o'clock the next morning, I had to go back to this company and give this book before their offices opened up. What are you willing to do to grow your business? There is no magic pill. We have to do something. We have to take a risk. We have to put forth energy. We have to sacrifice a few things. There is no magic pill. If there were a magic pill, everybody would be buying it, and then there would be no sense to be competing with anybody. 
because there will be no value to be interpreted and prices will drop by definition. My first Christmas in America, in Mount Olive, North Carolina, where I went to the two-year school, the only one that would accept the guy, couldn't speak English, didn't have any money, didn't know anybody. I'm still very grateful to them for doing that for me. Christmas came about, and school closed down. And I had to rent a room with Mrs. Carnegie for the holiday. But I wanted to be enterprising. So I had some tapes, reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Some of you will remember reel-to-reel -reel tapes about the little town of Bethlehem. This was Christmas. I thought, surely these radio stations around eastern North Carolina would want to run these programs about the little town of Bethlehem at Christmas time. So I got on a bus, Greyhound bus, and I went to the first city, and I walked to the first radio station, and I tried to sell them one of these tapes, and the owner said no. I went to the next one, and the manager said no. The next day, I got on the bus. I went to another town. I tried to sell this radio station a tape, and that one a tape, and that one a tape, and they all said no. Third day was a repeat of day one and day two, and by the fourth day, everybody said no, and I was completely out of money. It was Christmas. Everybody was with their family, singing Silent Night and lighting candles, looking under a Christmas tree. I was 7,000 miles away from the parent I had, my mother, whom I hadn't seen in five years, in a foreign land. It would have been really easy for me to give up. No money, nobody bought. The world said no to me. But I remember the words of my mother, who used to repeatedly say, in life, lots of things will happen. It's perfectly okay to be disappointed. People will disappoint you. Events will disappoint you. Maybe even you will disappoint yourself. But it's never okay. It's never okay to be discouraged. Disappointment is normal. Discouragement is dilapidating. Discouragement can lead to depression. Discouragement will not only keep us from growing our business, it can inadvertently diminish our business. Never allow yourself to be discouraged. It's easy to hear speaker after speaker tell you how they did it. When I was the boss, I did it this way. In my business, I did it this way. And it's so easy for every person in the audience to go, oh, I'm going to do it just like they did. Well, my dear friends, let me tell you something. When God breathed on your nostrils, God made you an amazing human being. You don't need to be like anybody else. You are just fine the way you are. All you need to do is to make sure that you have the right beliefs, to acquire the right knowledge, whether it's from your coach, your hero, your mentor, whether it's being right here at, at Mega Partnering, whether you're being in a class somewhere, and then being tenacious, not giving up. When things get tough, the tough must get going. Life is not meant to be easy. Life is meant to be challenging. But have you noticed that when things come easily to you, life is not that rewarding? When you work for it, man, you enjoy it. You're amazed by your own success. You appreciate it so deeply. So as you hear all these speakers, don't just say, I'm going to be like that. Say, how can I be the best that I can be? How do I evolve my business the best that my business can become? Because when you leave here, you still need someone to hold your hand. You still need someone to guide you and mentor you and coach you. I have my coaches. I do my studying every day. Nobody ever arrives at a place in life where they can be fully independent. We all need each other. Together, we make a partnership that's stronger, more effective, and more impactful. And so the reason I come to these events and talk with you, because I know your heart. Because I know so many of you. I've seen you time and again. And I know you're the best in the world. I know this room has some of the finest men and women I've ever met. 
I know that you have a hunger for entrepreneurship and a sense of free enterprise and a desire and a warmth to do something amazing in your life. And nobody, nobody can keep you from achieving your dreams. If a kid like me can come to America and really have nothing to offer but desire and have the blessings I've had in my life, I'll tell you what I tell my students. I teach all the freshmen. I teach all the seniors. I tell them there are no such thing as unrealistic dreams. There are only unrealistic timelines. You will grow your business. You will achieve your dreams in life. You will have enormous impact on those who cross your path. It's in your heart. It's just a question of bringing it forth, using it in the right way, with your beliefs, your knowledge, and your sense of tenacity. And when that happens, my friend, oh my, life is sweet. Life is joyful. Life is good. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.